Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Dr. Downey and today we are going to be talking about the best testosterone cycle. So what I mean by this is the best testosterone to use if you are contemplating just cycling testosterone. Now, many people will have definitions of what defines being the best testosterone and I suppose the title is just made to draw in views. However, I want to go over what you should consider if you are planning on running a testosterone only cycle. So the reason I mentioned cycle specifically and not cruising or replacement testosterone is because when looking at a cycle one of the biggest things we need to take into consideration is the fact that you are going to go off this agent. So an important factor to pay attention to would be your time to recovery and essentially what I mean by that is the time it takes for you once stopping the drug to recover back to your normal self i.e. to yourself where you are not suppressed i won't really be talking about health effects of testosterone cycles as i've covered this many times before in this i want to go over a theoretical cycle using testosterone that would minimize suppression the reason for this is that exogenous testosterone is quite suppressive that is mainly due to the fact that long acting esters tend to be used and you'll see this becomes a theme throughout this video the reason a lot of individuals like using orals is because they are so short acting and the time to recovery tends to be quicker in studies you'll see in previous videos I've made, LH and FSH, i.e. markers of suppression, tend to decrease but not to the extent that it would in a cycle consisting of testosterone cypionate. In these cycles, LH and FSH tend to become less than detectable almost, which again is not favorable in the context of coming off a cycle, which would make many individuals reluctant to run the cycle in the first place if they have to deal with complete suppression. So in this I'm going to introduce the idea of using short-acting testosterone and we'll go over the research and see what the research says about short-acting testosterone, more specifically testosterone propionate and suppression. And the reason why I think that if you are just going to cycle testosterone you should not use a long-acting ester and should rather consider a short-acting one if you have plans of trying to recover after the cycle. So we have a lot of research that it actually shows that short-acting testosterone becomes quite favorable when compared to long-acting testosterone in terms of suppression or degree of suppression. However, one of the first I'll go over is a review looking at the effects of longer-acting versus shorter-acting testosterone therapy. And in this review, they looked at a whole bunch of different studies using long-acting and short-acting and intermediate-acting testosterones. So short-acting in this context would be something that needs multiple daily dosing. Intermediate acting would be something that needs either daily administration or every other day administration. And then long acting would be your testosterone undecanoate and testosterone enanthate or cypionate. And what they found in this review, having looked over a lot of different papers, is that long acting injectables decreased FSH by 86.3% and LH by 71.8%. For those who don't know, FSH and LH are commonly used when looking at the degree of suppression since those are pituitary hormones that are part of this whole hypothalamus pituitary testosterone axis. And if they're low or decreased, it means that there is probably a degree of suppression. And in this case, we can see that FSH decreased by 86.3% in long-acting testosterone and LH decreased by 71.8. When compared to intermediate acting testosterone, for, for example, something like testosterone propionate, FSH decreased by 60% and LH decreased by 59%. Again, there was a degree of suppression. And in the short acting group, FSH decreased by 37.8% with LH decreasing by 47.3%. 
So what we can see from here is the more short acting a compound is, the less suppressive it is. But again, I do have my criticisms of these papers. If we look at short acting testosterone versus long acting testosterone, you commonly find that whilst short acting testosterone does bring testosterone levels back into range, it doesn't bring them as high into range as longer acting testosterone. And longer acting testosterone uses high initial doses. And I'll show you a table to demonstrate what I mean. As we can see here, when the testosterone gel patch is increased to 100 milligrams daily, as opposed to the 5 milligrams or 50 milligrams, we can see the change in LH is even greater. So what do I mean by this? Yes, short-acting testosterone does tend to be less suppressive, but at the same time, these shorter-acting testosterones do not reach as high a level, which is not necessarily problematic. But in that case, you cannot make direct comparisons, because as we know, with something like testosterone enanthate, as soon as you inject it, it does go above the therapeutic reference range and then dips, whereas something that the requires daily application might not reach these testosterone levels above the therapeutic range. But I'll go through a paper that shows that even in this situation, the shorter acting testosterone is still theoretically better. Now, it was very difficult to find human studies where testosterone propionate and a longer acting testosterone were compared directly. However, we do have a study which was performed in rats that does demonstrate the effect of shorter acting testosterone and its effect on the HPTA. As we can see in the study, when looking at testicle weight, we can see that while short-acting testosterone did have an effect on this in comparison to the control, longer-acting testosterone had a greater effect. And the same was demonstrated with LH levels. As we can see in this graph, LH levels were pretty much non-existent. When short-acting testosterone was compared to the control, there was no significant difference between them statistically. As I mentioned before, if we look at testosterone levels, we can see that in the long-acting testosterone group, testosterone levels were slightly higher. And again, the dose of testosterone is important when considering suppression. But is this little boost in serum testosterone levels worth the complete suppression of LH levels, well, that's an individual decision. An important comparison to some, the time to pregnancy, i.e. the time after the testosterone was stopped to the mouse impregnating another mouse was longer in the long-acting testosterone group. But again, this is just a study in mice, and we'll have to draw on some old studies done in humans to try demonstrate my point. And if I've lost you along the way, my point is that if you are running a testosterone cycle and it is just going to be a cycle and you want to minimize the risk of suppression, you should choose a short acting testosterone like testosterone propionate. So the first graph we are going to look at was done in humans and this is the effect of 25 milligrams of testosterone propionate in four men and the levels of testosterone and LH over time. And as you can see in this graph, with the 25 milligrams, there was indeed a bit of decrease in LH levels from baseline when testosterone levels increased above 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. However, the time to recovery, i.e. the time for the LH levels to go back to its baseline, was essentially a day if not less, 12 hours it would seem. However, that's a relatively small dose of testosterone propionate. What happens with the dose of 50 milligrams? And as I said previously, the higher the testosterone dose, the more suppressive it is. Is. And as we can see here in the group that was administered with 50 milligrams of testosterone propionate, there was a massive increase in testosterone propionate where levels reached above 2000 nanograms per deciliter, so much higher than they did in the 25 milligram group. And we can see LH levels decrease for about two days thereafter. They actually recovered and went above normal range. 
And I've seen this in a few clients who have come off a testosterone propionate cycle. Upon cessation of the testosterone propionate, their LH levels go to high levels of 9 to 12. And this is a few days after the cycle. And this goes back to the whole point of negative feedback. Due to the fact that testosterone propionate's half-life is so short, levels of testosterone rapidly decline after the injection, as we can see in the graphs I've shown. And this rapid decrease in testosterone with a slight suppression of endogenous testosterone results in the pituitary being stimulated or hyperstimulated in this case. And given the fact that it, the pituitary wasn't completely suppressed, it overshoots in the production of LH, and for a while LH levels will be above baseline. Now let's compare the two testosterone propionate groups to the effect of 250 milligrams of testosterone enanthate and its effect. So as we can see in this graph, testosterone does peak from the 250 milligram injection. The peak was not as great as that of testosterone propionate, which reached above 2,500 nanograms per deciliter. This peak was more or less similar to that of the 25 milligram testosterone propionate group. However, this peak is more sustained, obviously due to the fact that the ester has a longer half-life. And due to these high levels being sustained, we can see that the degree of suppression was fairly significant, and that degree of suppression was also sustained for longer. However, there was recovery after the 10th day, but in this group there wasn't an overshoot of LH levels. And remember, this was after a single injection with 250 milligrams of testosterone and anthate. With more frequent injections and more constant levels of testosterone, the suppression would probably be greater and more sustained. So as we can see from that study, it clearly demonstrates that the degree of suppression from testosterone propionate and the time to recovery is much shorter. And what the authors concluded is that the time to recovery is related to the half-life. However, it would have been better if we had studies that were performed over a longer duration. And we could see from there whether or not the time to recovery was still better in the testosterone propionate group. However, from other studies that we mentioned prior, it would seem that the time to recovery is better, and from anecdotes, it would seem that way. But there are limitations here. In the testosterone enanthate group, with more sustained high levels of testosterone or serum high levels, you get greater gains from that. Testosterone propionate creates a short peak. Is that significant enough to cause anabolism? From rat studies or mice studies looking at Levator Annie and the different testosterone esters, they all seem to be as anabolic when used over the similar time period. But again, there aren't any studies in humans, and I, I would like to ask you the question, if you've used different types of esters, which has been more anabolic? Has it been more anabolic to keep your testosterone levels high, normal, and constantly in that range without fluctuations? Or did you get more gains from a shorter acting ester? Another criticism or limitation might be the fact that does the time to recovery really matter? Does it make a massive difference if your testosterone levels go back to baseline faster? In theory, it makes sense, but we have no data to suggest this is true. Perhaps from a mental perspective, it would be more beneficial to have a quicker time to recovery. So how would you then use testosterone propionate in a way to minimize suppression? Well, if we go back to these graphs, let's take the 50 milligram example, although you could use the 25 milligram example. And as we can see here, although there isn't much research on this effect, timing your injection to the point of pituitary recovery is probably more idyllic if you do not want to suffer from the suppressive effects. So in the case of 50 milligrams of testosterone propionate, that would be injecting perhaps every three days to four days. Now again, if you use a higher dose, these effects will probably be more pronounced. As we can see, there's a massive difference between 50 milligrams of testosterone propionate versus 25 milligrams. In the 25 milligram group, the time to recovery 
was one day, whereas it's about three to four here. Unfortunately, we don't have data on higher dosages. Again, the nice part about testosterone propionate is the fact that once you stop the cycle, you don't have to wait for very long periods to retest your testosterone levels and see if you are back at baseline and whether or not a PCT might be needed, which if you've watched my podcast, it probably isn't. Testosterone levels wax and wane throughout the day, and if you replicate this, there is probably a less likelihood of being suppressed, whereas having constant levels of testosterone around, let's say, 1000 nanograms per deciliter from testosterone enanthate is probably more suppressive, whereas if you replicate that diurnal cycle, the body recognizes that more than it does constant levels. So let's summarize what we've gone over. This research shows that yes, shorter acting testosterones are not as suppressive, but at the same time, the higher the dose of the shorter acting testosterone, the more suppressive it is. And again, some may argue that shorter acting testosterones never really reach the high peaks that longer acting testosterones do. However, we demonstrated in the previous research paper that 50 milligrams of testosterone propionate gives a higher peak testosterone level than testosterone enanthate. Testosterone enanthate's peak lasts a lot longer than that of the testosterone propionate. It lasts a few days. So do those few days of longer peaks result in better gains? Well, I don't know, and there aren't studies on that, and which is why I've asked you. But overall from this, what we can see is that if you want to recover faster, it would probably be more suggestible to use a faster-acting testosterone, something like testosterone propionate which is why I think it's better from a cycle perspective. Might not be useful in a TRT perspective because you'd have to inject more often, but I thought I'd just share this information with you and let you know what I think about shorter acting testosterones. Obviously the decision is yours, but if considering a, using just a testosterone only cycle, a shorter acting testosterone might be more favorable. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learned something from it, and I'll see you in the next one.